Cambodia. A country of stunning landscapes and iconic wildlife. Swathes of tropical forest and lush floodplains provide refuge for countless species. Passing through the heart of Cambodia is the mighty Mekong River. The river's dramatic ebb and flow between the dry and wet season affects all life here. From the wetland species that await the annual flooding of the Great Lake, Tonle Sap. And those that live along the Mekong itself. Two others that live out on the edge of the vast floodplains. All living creatures must adapt their behavior to cope with Cambodia's dramatic seasonal change. It's April, the hottest month of the Cambodian dry season. The early morning mist belies the heat to come. The Mekong is at its lowest. These grasslands at the edge of the floodplains in the northeast haven't seen rain for months. By mid-morning, the air is scorching. For most creatures, it's already time to seek cover. Some won't see the coming rains at all. But their misfortune is another's advantage. The familiar silhouette of a vulture appears almost immediately in the skies above. This is a precious opportunity for an easy meal. A crow arrives first. It will have to work fast. Within minutes, a flock is circling. A soaring vulture can spot a carcass like this from six and a half kilometers away. The crow can't seem to find a way through the cow's tough hide. In any case, it's out of time. Despite the size of the meal, these vultures don't want to share, even with each other. Open wings are a threat. This male tries to box the others away from the prize. More and more hungry birds arrive on the scene. 
a mix of slender build and white rumped vultures. While the carcass is fresh, the easiest way in is the softer areas near the tail. A position worth fighting for. Others go in through the head where there is less traffic. Their long, featherless necks are perfectly adapted to get into every nook and cranny of the carcass. The vulture's ability to scavenge so effectively allows them to live largely unaffected by the seasonal drought. Their greatest challenge seems to be dealing with each other. The vultures must compete for access before they can eat. Some fight, while others size up rivals with flamboyant threat displays. Everyone seems to be losing in the mayhem. While it might look like chaos, there is method to the madness. A hierarchy slowly emerges which regulates access to the carcass. The younger and weaker fall back. leaving the strongest to eat first. But this victory is short-lived. A second wave arrives. They must also stake their claim. The new arrival makes herself look as large as possible. She establishes her dominance and earns her turn at the cow. She sees off another challenger and with this bizarre march reasserts her dominance as she returns to feed. But vultures aren't blessed with patience. There is always someone ready to jump the queue. Despite all the posturing and fighting, things look more brutal than they are. It's in no one's interest to get seriously hurt. Vultures are actually quite social animals. They depend upon each other to find food, and the crowding around the carcass serves a greater purpose. A golden jackal surveys from a distance. Soon this dysfunctional team will have to defend its spoils. Life for the scavengers is good when the Mekong's water level is low.
From its source in the Himalayas, the Mekong flows over 3,000 kilometers through Southeast Asia before it reaches Cambodia. The start of a near 500 kilometer journey through the center of the country. Most animals in Cambodia wait for the monsoon rains and times of plenty before they breed. But in these forests along the Mekong, there is one peculiar resident that isn't phased by the lack of resources in the dry season. These Lyle's flying foxes are already well into their breeding season. They can raise their pups earlier in the year because of their ability to adapt their diet to the seasons. When fruit isn't readily available, they eat nectar and pollen instead. Flying foxes are unique among bats. Their eyes aren't sensitive to light, so they can be active in the day as well as at night. While most bats retreat into caves as the sun rises, flying foxes roost in large groups out in the open. They make the most of the shade on offer, but when the April heat becomes too much, these bats have a simple solution. And it's all in the wings. They act like giant fans, but there's more to it. Their wings are packed with blood vessels like an elephant's ear. Each flap draws blood into the wing muscles. The more blood that passes through each wing, the more heat they lose, like water circulating through a radiator. Some prefer a lazier option. A male lets his wings droop beneath him. This allows heat to dissipate without all the effort. These bats are attentive mothers. They have to be. The young cling to them for the first several weeks of their lives. clambering around in the canopy with someone else attached. Suckling in this position also requires some coordination. This mother guides her hungry pup towards her nipple under her armpit. This way mum can feed her pup and keep cool all at the same time.
In the cooler evening air, again the bats turn to their wings, but now it's to keep themselves warm. Wrapping their wings around their bodies like this reduces the blood flow and in turn minimizes heat loss. As darkness approaches, the bats become more active. This is their time. Soon the colony disappears into the night to forage along the banks of the Mekong. Vultures and bats aren't the only animals that make the most of the heat. Oriental pratincoles are a desert species from Australia that migrate to Cambodia for the dry season. Despite the lack of food, they choose to breed during the dry months while their predators are less active. Farmland has become an almost ideal habitat. Livestock keep the vegetation in check and provide hoof prints which the birds use as nests. However, this association with man also has its risks. Part of the farmer's land management involves burns. The fires clear unwanted vegetation and return nutrients to the soil. But they are bad news for these ground nesting birds. This pair have just laid their eggs in the area. They're reluctant to leave. As the flames draw closer, they have no choice. They must abandon their nest. But all is not lost. The pair will mate again before the rains arrive and they return home. Their next nest will have better chances of survival. The fires leave the land more fertile. Plants quickly grow, attracting insects, which provide more food for the pair to successfully raise a family. Back at the carcass, the commotion has attracted some unwanted attention. A golden jackal, one of Cambodia's most fearsome predators. Jackals are opportunists that often hunt alone. He sizes up his opposition. Vultures are always first to stake a claim at a carcass. They have an aerial advantage. Finding a carcass from the ground is far less efficient. Jackals and other terrestrial scavengers arrive second. And latecomers must fight for their scraps. 
Although he is severely outnumbered, hunger prevails. Charging in, he tries to panic the vultures into flight. Individually, they're no match for the jackal. But together, they can defend their prize. So many beaks and talons can cause serious injury. He manages to break their lines. and quickly reaps his rewards. But this opportunity might not last. The jackal knows the vultures have strength in numbers. He is rightfully wary. He tears hungrily at the carcass. Each mouthful could be his last. There are too many birds. And with the jackal in retreat, the vultures fall back into a feeding frenzy. Again, the jackal charges into a mass of razor-sharp beaks and claws. He tries to grab another bite, but for every vulture he scares off, there are three more to replace it. All the jackal can do is admit defeat. It's not only the animals that have it tough during the dry months. The Mekong provides fish for millions of people that live along its lakes and tributaries. But this bounty is seasonal. These are the stilt houses that surround the lake. Normally, the water would be lapping at the floorboards, but in the dry season, the level can drop around six meters. There are hardly any fish to catch, and life is hard. The struggle to exist in harmony with the Mekong cycle is nothing new. It has shaped Cambodian life for centuries. Angkor Wat, the largest religious structure on earth and the last remains of the largest pre-industrial city in history. The population once stood at close to a million people, but during the dry season there was not enough water to support them.
their solution is hidden beneath the surrounding jungle. A vast series of reservoirs and irrigation channels that stored monsoon rain and the seasonal floodwaters of Lake Tonle Sap. Although nothing is left but ruins, the seasonal cycles that these ancient people faced still shape the lives of the humans and animals that live in Cambodia today. With the jackal out of the picture, the vultures are left in peace to do what they do best. These vultures are known as gulpers because of their voracious eating habits. Their bills aren't strong enough to tear off muscle from the bone, so they gulp down the larger, softer parts. Soon, a new face appears. Their red-headed cousins have been holding back. They usually wait until the gulpers have opened up the carcass before they join the feast. Red-headed vultures have broader, stronger bills compared to the gulpers and are known as rippers. Their bills are adapted to work parts of the carcass that the gulpers can't. The two groups have evolved strategies to make the most of a carcass without coming into direct competition. As scavengers, vultures have to make the most of an opportunity like this. Given the chance, vultures will gorge themselves to the point where they can't fly. They store undigested food in these extended pouches near their throats called crops. With their crops bulging, the vultures fall back and slip into a semi-conscious state as they digest. Some have eaten so much they can barely stand. It might be a while till they can next take off. A night's rest and the vultures are ready to resume the feast. There isn't much left. The vultures no longer waste time sizing each other up with threat displays. It's now every bird for itself, until nothing remains. As grotesque as it looks, Vultures play a vital role in maintaining the health of the local ecosystem. Recycling dead animals this efficiently helps reduce the spread of disease. Their highly corrosive stomach acid allows them to safely digest putrid meat that might poison other animals. They're nature's perfectly evolved waste disposal units. 
vultures in Southeast Asia are now critically endangered. Cambodia is home to the last stable population. Their range corresponds exactly to where farmers still allow livestock to roam free through the forests. The vultures depend on the cattle that doesn't survive this free-range existence. Thanks to conservation efforts and this traditional cattle farming, vulture numbers have stabilized. The future of these birds looks bright. Carol's Cambodia's great annual seasonal change. The monsoon rains arrive first, but they're only the start. A more significant event takes place hundreds of miles away at the Mekong's origin in the Himalayas. The spring snow melt the Mekong delivers this salvation. The river pours down from the mountains and surges through Thailand and Laos before reaching Cambodia. It breathes life into the dry landscape. Eventually, the raging Mekong reaches Tonle Sap, and the lake swells out into the surrounding floodplains. The landscape quickly transforms. Dead plant material from the dry season breaks down in the water creating a nutrient-rich aquatic environment. Shellfish, small fish and aquatic insects arrive first. And this influx attracts a host of predators. Within weeks, the once dry floodplains are a paradise for wetland birds. Bee-eaters pick off dragonflies, while spear-hunting egrets and black-winged stilts stalk the shallows. Purple swamp hens descend on the area in their hundreds. Distinctive long toes distribute their weight as they clamber about the wetlands. They mostly eat plants, but will also catch small animals such as mollusks, insects, worms, even rodents. They prefer to stand on one leg as they feed, clutching their food in the other. For most of the year, they live in large, peaceful flocks. But when the breeding season arrives, the males begin to squabble. They fight for mates and territory.
They're also known to attack and kill predators that get too close to their young. Once they've found a mate, couples separate off into small groups to breed. Within these groups, swamp hens are unusually community-oriented. Everyone shares the responsibility of caring for the chicks. The young mature quickly, allowing parents to have two broods a season. two months, the chicks are old enough to help out in group life. They learn to look out for each other and will even help their parents raise the next brood. But this utopian society isn't without its problems. Osprey patrol these wetlands. It's after the chicks. With few places to hide, the swamp pens have evolved a specialized defense. They engage these aerial assailants in psychological warfare. While they feed, they continually flash their white rumps. The flashing makes the predator think that it's been spotted. Assuming it's lost the advantage of a surprise attack, the osprey heads off in search of an easier meal. Purple swamp pens are smarter than they look. The floodwaters from the Mekong transform the stilt villages around Lake Tonle Sap. As the water continues to rise, the villagers move up through the specially designed layers in their houses. In a matter of weeks, the stilts become completely submerged. Over the course of the wet season, Tonle Sap will expand to five times its original size. Eventually, it will cover one-fifth of Cambodia. The floodwaters are stocked with fish heading to the lake to breed. Because of this annual bounty, Tonle Sap is known as the beating heart of the nation. As the lake expands into the floodplain, the water slowly consumes the surrounding landscape. This creates wetlands and submerged forests, the perfect breeding grounds for the arriving fish. There are over 500 species of fish in the area. The trees above are full of lively macaques. These women are heading deep into the flooded forest. The women return each day to check traps that they've left overnight.
but they can't do this from the boats. Under the watchful eyes of the macaques, the women collect their haul. Fish are so important to Cambodia that the currency, the real, is named after a small silver carp that's a staple in many people's diet. Cambodia's wetlands are a haven for bird life. One species in particular catches the eye above the rest. The Eastern Sarus Crane. At the start of the wet season, they're still at their winter feeding grounds, further south along the Mekong. They won't migrate north to breed until the wetlands surrounding Tonle Sap are deep enough to protect their young from predators. For the moment, their days are lazy. After a morning preen, it's time to feed. Sarah's cranes will eat just about anything that moves. Insects, crustaceans, small fish, and amphibians are all on the menu. These magnificent birds partner for life and can live for up to 80 years. During the breeding season, pairs do not usually tolerate the company of others. But for now, until they migrate north, they congregate in large groups. This is a time of rare harmony between these cranes. Staying together like this reduces their risk of predation. There is always someone on the lookout. Despite the harmony, a flock of this size requires organization. There's a strict pecking order to keep everyone in line. As the flock forages, the larger dominant birds lead. The smaller ones fall in behind. As the weeks pass and the breeding season approaches, the mood in the flock begins to change. Tolerance for their fellow bird drops and tempers start to flare. These birds are formidable. They can reach heights of over two meters, and their wings span more than 2.5. This squabbling is a small taste of things to come. Soon they will fly north to their breeding grounds at Tonle Sap and compete for mates. Once common across Southeast Asia, Sara's cranes are now under serious threat. Cambodia is one of their final strongholds. Their survival depends on the protection of their dry season and wet season habitats.
The Cambodian government has a conservation program that encourages locals to help out with a surprising natural solution. Grazing buffalo keep the grass short and in turn maintain an ideal habitat for these endangered cranes to feed. As evening falls, the cranes head to their roosting grounds in nearby trees. Soon they will fly off for the last time and head towards Tonle Sap to breed. Water has and always will occupy a special place in the Cambodian psyche. For the animals that live here, the rivers and lakes of Cambodia are equally vital. Over the coming months, the floodwaters of Tonle Sap will gradually recede and the cranes will return south. And as the dry season approaches, the Pratt and Coles will return from Australia to breed and the flying foxes will once again start to raise their pups. Season after season, year after year, life here is dictated by the Mekong and its seasonal flow. This mighty river truly is the lifeblood and beating heart of everything that lives here.